Ave Maria, welcome to the History Programme, a monthly series of programmes produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled The Arrival of the Passionist Order in England and Ireland. As I mentioned in an earlier programme, I spent several years on assignment in Stoke-on-Trent in England. This city is located in Staffordshire in the West Midlands part of England, a part of England that is rich in history, especially Catholic history. The town of Stone is situated just a few miles from Stoke. St Dominic's church in the town is the resting place of two well-known figures, Mother Mary Halrahan, foundress of the Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine of Siena, who still have a convent next to the church, and Archbishop Ullathorne, who became the first Bishop of Birmingham when the hierarchy was restored in England in the middle of the 19th century. Australian listeners may recall that Ullathorne spent a short number of years in Australia at one time being the Vicar Apostolic until the arrival of Bishop Paulding. The church in stone is beautiful and well worth a visit if you are in the area. However, of particular interest to us in this programme is the small chapel of St Anne, which is located on the convent grounds. This Pugin designed chapel was built in 1844. The first Mass there was celebrated by an Italian Passionist priest who had arrived in England just a few years previously to start a foundation for his congregation and to work for the, for the conversion of England to the Catholic faith. The priest's name was Father Dominic Barbary, now Blessed Dominic Barbary, and he is the starting point of this evening's programme. Dominic Barbary was born on the 22nd of June, 1792, in Viterbo, in Italy, of peasant stock. His family were devout Catholics, and Dominic joined the Passionist while still young. The Congregation of the Passion of Jesus Christ, better known as the Passionists, was founded in Italy by Saint Paul of the Cross. The congregation is best known for the giving of retreats and parish missions. Not long after Dominic entered the Passionists, he had a mystical experience when praying at the Lady Altar in the church. He described it himself as a clear notion with a kind of infallible assurance that he was to preach the Catholic faith in England. From that moment, England's conversion became the object of his prayer and the theme of his entire life. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1818. He was a man of exceptional talent and went on to become professor of philosophy and theology. In 1830, Father Dominic met with some prominent English Catholics including the Right Honourable George Spencer, a recent convert and now a seminarian in Rome. Spencer had also made the conversion of England a special object of his prayer and would continue to do so when he returned to England as a priest. We will talk about Father Spencer in more detail later on in the programme. In 1841, Father Dominic arrived in England with the purpose of founding a monastery there. 
The following year saw the first monastery founded at Aston Hall, near Stone. Shortly afterwards, a mass centre was opened in Stone itself. Listeners should remember that it was still only 13 years since the passing of the Catholic Emancipation Act, and the Passionists were probably the first religious ever seen by the local people. A widespread prejudice against Catholics still existed everywhere, amongst all classes of the people. So when the locals saw Father Dominic, in his black religious habit, walking the journey from Aston Hall to Stone and back every day, it was a strange sight for them indeed. The children of the town did the first thing that came into their heads. They pelted Father Dominic with stones. In 1844, as we mentioned earlier, St Anne's Chapel was built in the town of Stone. In 1845, John Henry Newman was residing with a small community in Littlemore, near Oxford. Discerning his future, having preached his last sermon as an Anglican minister and a couple of years previously. On the 8th of October that year, Father Dominic was due to call in to see one of the members of the community. Cardinal Newman himself takes up the story in his book, Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Little more, October the 8th, 1845. I am this night expecting Father Dominic, the Passionist, who, from his youth, has been led to have distinct and direct thoughts, first of the countries of the North, then of England. After 30 years almost waiting, he was, without his own act, sent here. But he has had little to do with conversions. I saw him here for a few minutes on St. John the Baptist's day last year. He is a simple holy man, and withal gifted with remarkable powers. He does not know of my intention, but I mean to ask him admission into the one fold of Christ. Father Dominic arrived at Littlemore late that night, drenched from the rain. Father Dominic, in a letter, letter to his superior in Rome, describes the event for us. We reached little more about an hour before midnight, and I took up my position before the fire to dry myself. The door opened, and what a spectacle it was for me to see at my feet John Henry Newman, begging me to hear his confession and admit him into the bosom of the Catholic Church. Further Passionist foundations were made in the next few years. First, Worcester in Gloucestershire, and later Hampstead in London. St Joseph's Retreat in Highgate in London is well worth a visit if you were in, that area, in, the, in the area. By the way, retreat is the word that the founder of the Passionist used from monastery, and it is still in use today. Father Dominic edified all who came into contact with him as he worked for the conversion of England, preaching missions all over the country. His only visit to Ireland was in May 1849, when he preached a three-week parish mission in St. Audion's Church in High Street in Dublin. On the 27th of August 1849, Father Dominic was travelling on the train from London to Worcester when he suffered a heart attack. He was taken off at Reading and brought to a nearby tavern where he died later that afternoon. In his death agony he oft repeated the prayer, Lord may thy most holy will be done. In 1963 in the midst of the Second Vatican Council, Father Dominic was beatified by Pope Blessed Paul VI. His remains now rest in the Church of St. Anne and Blessed Dominic in Sutton, St. Helens in Lancashire. 
And in 2010, for the Dominic's most famous convert, Cardinal Newman was beatified by Pope Benedict XVI. The Right Honourable George Spencer was born in London on the 21st of December 1799, the youngest son of the second Earl of Althorp. The Spencers are one of the wealthiest aristocratic families in the country. Perhaps the most famous member of the family in recent times has been Lady Diana Spencer, later Princess Diana, killed so tragically in 1997. In 1824, George became an Anglican minister. However, he became attracted to the Catholic faith, probably as a result of spending time on the continent. And in 1830, he was received into the Catholic Church. He then went on to the English College in Rome to study for the priesthood. Interestingly, the director of the college at that time was Dr. Nicholas Wiseman, later to become Cardinal Wiseman and the first Archbishop of Westminster after the restoration of the Catholic hierarchy in England. Dr. Wiseman was impressed by this seminarian zeal for the conversion of England. George was ordained to the priesthood in Rome in 1832. As we mentioned earlier, Father Dominic Barbary had met with Father Spencer when the latter was still only a seminarian in Rome. Remember, this was several years prior to Father Dominic's arrival in England. Both men shared a zeal for the conversion of England to the Catholic faith. Father Spencer returned to England and worked zealously for this conversion, starting up a crusade of prayer for the conversion of England. Edmund Sheridan Purcell, in his biography, Life of Cardinal Manning, writes, Father Spencer spent his life in this noble and bloodless crusade. It was sanctioned by the Holy See, quarterly supported by Cardinal Wiseman in England and by bishops in every Catholic country in Europe. It was an association of universal prayer throughout Christendom for the conversion of England. The proposal of joint prayers for the restoration of the unity of Christendom was adopted by large numbers of Anglicans. Father Spencer worked as a priest in West Bromwich, near Birmingham, until 1839, when he became a professor at the nearby Oscott College. In 1846, he entered the Passionists, receiving the name and religion of Ignatius. He continued his prayer crusade and was renowned as a great preacher, giving retreats and missions at home and abroad. However, he was even more renowned for his virtuous life. On one occasion, following a visit to the Passionist Novitiate in St. Saviour's Retreat in Broadway in Worcestershire, and a talk with each of the novices, the novice master reported that the novices were very much edified and formed an opinion that Father Ignatius was really a living saint. He died in Scotland on the 1st of October 1864. His remains now rest beside those of Blessed, Dom Blessed Dominic Barbary in the Church of St Anne and Blessed Dominic in Sutton in St Helens in Lancashire. And early in 2015 Pope Francis declared Father Ignatius Spencer venerable, which is, a, which is a declaration that he practiced the virtues to a heroic degree. In 1856, the Passionists expanded across the Irish Sea to make their first foundation in Ireland. Dublin's Archbishop, Dr. Cullen, was anxious to have the congregation in his diocese. A house, Mount Argus, near Harold's Cross in Dublin, was purchased 
and a church was built onto the house. The construction of a new church and a monastery followed within a few years. It is officially known as St. Paul's Retreat, but has been properly called Mount Argus by generations of Dubliners. I know the place well myself, having grown up just a mile or so away. The first rector of this monastery was Father Paul Mary Packenham. The Right Honourable Charles Packenham was born in Dublin on the 21st of September 1821, the fourth son of the second Earl of Longford. So he was born just a few years before the passing of the Catholic Emancipation Act. The Packenham family is a landed aristocratic family, with their family seat in Packenham Hall, Castle Pollard, County Westmead in Ireland. In recent years, some members of the family have been Catholic. However, in Charles's day, the family was Protestant, and Charles was brought up as a Protestant. The family were well connected. Charles was a nephew of the Duke of Wellington. As you might expect, given his background, he was sent to public school in England for his education. In England, the term public school means a very expensive private boarding school. And not surprisingly, given that some members of the family were prominent military officers, he was sent to the Royal Military College in Sandhurst to finish his schooling and to prepare for a career in the army. He was commissioned as an officer in the army and became a captain in the Grenadier Guards. A promising career in the army was in store for him, but as we shall see, God had other plans. The conversion of John Henry Newman had set the Protestant world in England talking and thinking. Captain Charles Packenham was no exception. He thought and prayed things over. He read books on theology, and God showed Charles the light that he sought. He made up his mind to enter the Catholic Church. On the 15th of August, 1850, he was received into the church by Dr. Wiseman. Just a few weeks before Dr. Wiseman was made a cardinal and appointed Archbishop of Westminster in the restoration of the English hierarchy. One of his sisters reacted in a very negative way to the news of his conversion, exclaiming, For goodness sake, Charles, get married as soon as you can, or you will end up by becoming a monk. Prophetic words indeed. Charles decided to enter religious life and join the Passionists, which had been introduced into England just a few years previously. Charles's sister could scarcely believe this latest news about him, lamenting, I wish he were dead. Charles's uncle, the Duke of Wellington, also known as the Iron Duke, took the news in a more positive way, exclaiming, Well, Charles, you have been a good soldier. Now strive to be a good monk. Indeed, I recall reading in a book some years back about the Sisters of Mercy in the Crimean War, in which it is recounted how a relative of Charles, an officer in the British Army, is reported to have told one of the Mercy nuns about Charles's entrance into the Passionists and also the positive reaction of the Duke of Wellington. As an aside, it is worth noting that the Duke of Wellington was the British Prime Minister who steered the passage of the Catholic Emancipation Act in 1829. Interestingly, he did not support Catholic emancipation in the beginning, but eventually did come to see it as a necessity, for whatever reason. He had to persuade senior members of his own party, as well as King George, that the Act must be passed, and for that history should be grateful to him. But let us return to Charles. 
In due course, he arrived at St. Saviour's Retreat, the Passionist Monastery in Broadway, Worcestershire, to embrace the religious life. St. Saviour's was founded in 1850, when the Passionists moved out of Worcester. Charles's health deteriorated during the novitiate, but still he observed the strict rules of the congregation in a perfect manner, and so edified all. Australian listeners will be interested to know that one of Charles's fellow novices was Julian Tennyson Woods, who eventually had to leave the congregation for health reasons. This is the same Father Woods who later went to Australia and helped found the Sisters of St. Joseph with Mother Mary MacKillop. Woods would later write in his recollections of Charles. He was naturally averse to speak of his former life. He would have made no exception in my case, but for one circumstance. He was for someone's infirmarian at a time when I chanced to be laid up with a tedious illness, and he used to make me forget my pains and beguile the weary sleepless hours by turning my attention to other things. Thus I came to know many parts of his early career which are indelibly fixed upon my memory. Poor Pakenham. How well I can remember his appearance as he sat by my bedside in the long Gothic infirmary of St. Wilfred's Retreat in Staffordshire. His gentle but animated face, his mortified yet affable manner, his light, spare form in the austere habit of the Passionists are not easily forgotten. And when one heard his words, so full of piety, of sense, and even of lively wit at times, he soon came to be as much impressed upon the heart as upon the recollection. During his time in St. Saviour's, a Dutch Passionist priest arrived by the name of Father Charles Hauben, and we will speak about him in a few minutes. Charles Pakenham received the name in religion of Paul Mary, possibly to avoid confusion with the Dutch priest. On the 29th of September, 1855, Brother Paul Mary was ordained a priest by Bishop Ullathorne. After a short stint in Rome, Father Paul Mary was assigned to Ireland in 1856, becoming the first rector of the new foundation at Mount Argus. Father Paul Mary edified all by his saintly conduct. His fellow religious had a holy example to follow, and the church was soon filled with throngs of local people who came to hear his preaching and bring their problems to him in confession. However, as is sometimes the case with holy people, God takes them from our midst at an early age. In November 1856, during a retreat he was giving in the nearby parish of Rat Mines, and only a half a year after his arrival in Ireland, Father Paul Mary was taken seriously ill. Although he continued to work, he never fully recovered his health. And on the 1st of March, 1857, he passed on to his reward. He was only 35 years of age. On the day of his death, Father Paul Mary was due to have preached a charity sermon in the Jesuit church, Gardner Street in Dublin, in aid of the Poor Clare Convent in Harold's Cross. His fellow passionist, Father Ignatius Spencer, took his place and announced to the people gathered in the church, The voice of him who was to have dressed you today shall never again be heard upon this earth. One who was present on the occasion recorded that a suppressed wail of grief was heard throughout the crowded church. His funeral, presided over by the Archbishop of Dublin, Dr Cullen, was attended by thousands of Dubliners. The newspapers reported that Dublin mourned over Father Paul Mary 
with a universal cry of sorrow. His remains now rest in Mount Argus. We have already mentioned the Dutch Passionist, Father Charles Haubin. This Father Charles was born John Andrew Haubin in Holland on the 11th of December 1821 to a simple Catholic family. He was a pious lad and from an early age he wanted to be a priest. Whilst doing national service in the army he heard about the Passionists and decided to join them. At the end of his national service in 1845 he travelled to Belgium to enter the Passionists in that country, receiving the name and religion of Charles. On the 21st of December 1850 Brother Charles was ordained a priest. In 1852 Father Charles was assigned to England, where he first encountered Irish Catholics, many of whom were refugees from the Great Famine in Ireland. After five years in England, he was assigned to Mount Argus in Dublin. Father Charles was fond of the Irish and called them my people. He never mastered the English language, so preaching was not his forte. However, he became well known as a confessor and comforter of the sick. His charismatic gift of healing brought crowds of people to Mount Argus to be blessed by him, as many as 300 per day. In one case, a six-year-old boy who had lost his eyesight was blessed by Father Charles. The first thing he saw was Father Charles with his arms outstretched. Of course, we should always remember that it is God who cures, and holy people like Father Charles are only the instrument that he uses for this purpose. With the exception of an eight-year stint in England, Father Charles remained in Mount Argus until the end of his life. Father Charles passed on to his reward on the 5th of January, 1893. His remains now rest in a shrine inside a church. Pope St. John Paul II beatified Father Charles in 1988. And on the 3rd of June, 2007, he was proclaimed a saint by Pope Benedict XVI. He is now known as St. Charles of Mount Argus. If you were in Dublin, the church at Mount Argus is well worth a visit. I paid a visit there on my short stay in Ireland a couple of years ago. The shrine to St. Charles is beautiful and a magnificent display of the history of the Passionists is housed in the museum nearby. So, as we have seen, the foundation of the Passionists in England and Ireland had a wonderful beginning with holy members such as Blessed Dominic Barbary, Venerable Ignatius Spencer, Father Paul Mary Pakenham and St. Charles of Mount Argus. The Passionist congregation continued to expand over the years and in time more retreats were founded in Ireland, England Scotland and Wales. In 1887, five Passionists from this province travelled to Australia at the invitation of Cardinal Moran to establish a foundation in Australia. Cardinal Moran was Australia's very first Prince of the Church and a nephew of Dublin's Cardinal Cullen. I was lucky enough to visit the Passionists retreat in Adelaide last year it is a beautiful place to visit. This episode of the History Programme was researched and presented by Frostalanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it and will join us again next month for another episode of the History Programme.
For more information on the Passionist Congregation, you could visit our Irish website www.passionist.ie That's www.passionist.ie Ave Maria. And I just thought I'd ask you, Brother Solanas, uh, yep. uh, with that lovely um, uh, history, uh, I was very interested in uh, when you spoke about Father Paul Mary, about his, and you, you mentioned that the habit was very austere and going back then. I was just wondering, you know, what, what type of habit it would have been? Would it be the same today? Or Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. I think that the habit hasn't changed um, since the time of the foundation of the order. The material would probably would have been rougher material then. Um, uh, it's always been a sort of a black habit and the, the insignia of, of our Lord's passion is imprinted, I think, over the heart. Um, um, and, and even today, like, I mean, when, the, um, when you see a passionist, um, that, that the habit is still the same, like, I mean, but it may be a lighter material now. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and that would have been, I suppose, a shock for a lot of people um, coming into just, just a few years after Catholic emancipation to see people in these black habits. Because, I mean, uh, even soutans, like, you know, cassocks would have been very rare, uh, this, to, to, you know, we, even for secular priests to wear, like, on the streets. And, of course, the Passionists were, were basically like monks, and they were poor. And, as I said earlier on, they, they used to walk from, from, from um, their monastery to stone and back every day. And, and, and uh, you know, you can imagine what the, what the people would have thought mm -hmm. when, when, when they saw them. Um, and um, it's interesting as well in, the, in, in this that they, um, a lot of the, the, the people who start were off in England and the Passionists were, were actually, they, they came from noble families, aristocrat, aristocratic yeah. families, and, and they're, they're joining one of the most austere orders in the church, which happened to be one of the early ones to be um, reintroduced in England after Catholic emancipation. You know, like Lady Diana Spencer's uh, ancestors and, and the Earl of Packham's who are still around like today, um, their, their ancestors like, you know, were, were we're founders of, that of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it is. It is. The the dispensers and the Churchills like were were connected. Gee. You know. So so when you went to Adelaide. Yeah. And you, what were there many passionists when you went there? There were the, the, when I went to Adelaide. It was there was an ad limina of of the secular clergy for the diocese with the bishop. So all of the priests were there. There were certainly some passionists there. I I, I don't know um, how many of the people I saw were, were passionists, but it's a big monastery that mo monastery that they have there, very very big monastery there and um, a big church. I think it might be a parish church now as well. Um, but uh, yeah, they can keep it going, and there's a beautiful garden there as well. Um, and and um, you know, I think they're they were they're one of the big orders I think in Adelaide. Um, I think in, in Perth you have the Redemptorists, I think, from memory. Like, I mean, there's a big monastery um, of Redemptorists here as well, so so something similar there. But but a beautiful place, and it's, um, t it just reminds you, tomorrow is the Feast of St. Maria Goretti, and, of course, the Passionists promoted St. Maria Goretti because they were in her town. And when you go into Adelaide, if memory serves me right, there's a big, huge picture, painted picture of St. Maria Goretti just uh, over the entrance door. Um, oh. in, in Adelaide, yeah. So tomorrow, is her, tomorrow was her feast day as oh. well. So that's, that's, that's uh, interesting to point that out. Wow. You, you said that, um, that St. Charles assisted all those uh, many, though he was a comforter to the sick. That's right. So uh, the Passion is, what, what, what's their apostle? Their apostle is, is, to, is basically to preach missions. Um, you know, they 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 they'd say like in Ireland in the old days, if your if your parish was wasn't doing so well, like you get into redemptorists to the passionists, and they preached the missions. The parish missions were the old missions that they would preach, one for men and one for women, and that's their their mission, um, and they give retreats. So, the the, the the monasteries for the passionists would hold, would would have a, have a, uh, a room for all these passionist priests that would be travelling all all over the place giving missions, um, but he was Dutch. And I suppose they didn't have enough English-speaking priests at the time. They were starting out in England and Ireland, um, so his English wasn't great. But he was a he was a confessor. He had other gifts. He had other gifts, and and he's famous in Ireland, in Dublin, Saint Saint Charles, Father Charles of Mount Argus, we used to call him when I was growing up. Wow. 
um, and I remember in the 1980s um, there was a nun in Ireland she was the oldest person in Ireland at the time and I think she actually had met him uh, when she was a little girl um, so that's the first time I ever heard of him but he's he's well known in, 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 in uh, um, for many many generations um, uh, with Dubliners uh, St. Charles now, Father Charles Oh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you for Thanks, Sister yep. So we've uh, come to the end of uh, this evening's program. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, especially for our live yeah. presentation. We enjoy the live yeah. component to the, to the radio program. Uh, I hope you join us next week. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Ave Maria.